Romans chapter 14 this morning. Romans chapter 14. We did chapter 13 in one week. We talked last week about four reasons Paul gave us that we should be the best citizens of our nation. If you remember that last week, Christians ought to be the best citizens. How many can you name one of the four reasons why we should be the best citizens? <laughs> You're cheating because you have notes. Well, that's, that's the point, to have notes so you can remember. What's the, what's the number one reason? For wrath's sake. sake. In other words, I fear the punishment of the government if I break the law. Amen? What's another reason for being best Christians? For our conscience' sake towards God. Amen? Uh, what's the third reason? Because we love God and we love people. And then last is Jesus' sake. Amen? For Jesus' sake. Jesus is coming back. And when he comes back, may he find us faithful. Amen? And so that is Romans chapter 13. We get into Romans chapter 14, and tonight, or this morning, we're talking about We Are the Lord's, a subtitle, We All Will Give Account of Ourselves to God. We Are the Lord's. And we will be studying the first 12 verses of Romans chapter 14. The truth of the matter is, these days, and not just these days, but all throughout church history, and even farther back than church history, division and disunity have always been a major problem for God's people. Division and disunity. Even in the Old Testament, we see civil wars and family disputes all throughout Israel, throughout the history of the Old Testament. Almost every church mentioned in the New Testament had divisions to deal with. For example, the Corinthians were divided over which leader they followed. Some followed Paul, some followed Apollos, some said, oh, we just follow Jesus. Remember that? Uh, Some of the members were even suing each other in, in Corinthians, and we see that as well. Some of the Galatians were biting and devouring one another, the Bible says. Church members of Ephesus and Colossae had to be reminded of the importance of Christian unity In the church in Philippi, we had two women who were at odds with each other, and as a result, were splitting the church. Is it any wonder why the psalmist said in Psalm 133, verse 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. This is something that we must strive for, and we must strive for unity around the doctrines of the Word of God, around our common faith, around our common salvation. If if a church is not united, a church will be destroyed. If a family is not united, a family will be destroyed. If relationships, marriage relationships, work relationships, relationships with our kids, if we are not in unity, those relationships will fall apart. Many of the problems stemmed from people's backgrounds. The Jews, in in the case of uh, Romans uh, chapter 14, the Jews were saved out of a strict legalistic background that would be difficult to forget and difficult to give up. The Gentiles had never had to worry about diets and days, holidays, and so on. The first church council in, in Acts chapter 15 debated whether or not Gentiles could be saved without the law, and were they required after they were saved to keep the law or to, or to not have to keep the law. In Rome, the believers were divided, as we'll see in a moment as we read our text, over diet and special days. Some believe that it was a sin to eat meat, so they only ate vegetables. The, the Bible word here is herbs. Others believe that it was okay to eat anything because all things were given to men by God. Some members believe that it was a sin not to observe certain Jewish holy days, while others believe that it wasn't necessary to keep those holy days. The problem isn't what they believed. The problem was that they were being very loud on issues that the scriptures were very quiet. And isn't that true of us today? We tend to get loud on issues that are of personal preference or principles that we base those personal preferences on, but Scripture is not very clear about those things. 
They began to criticize each other and to judge one another over issues of preference or what some might call non-essentials. How many of you have found out that there are many gray areas in the Christian life? Anybody found that out? A lot of gray areas in the Christian life. In other words, the Bible doesn't clearly say thou shalt not go to movie theaters or thou shalt not smoke a cigarette, right? The Bible doesn't say those things. And yet many Christians will emphasize a lot on the minor things, on the things that Scripture is silent on. There's no verse in the Bible that says you need to wear a suit and tie to church. No verse in the Bible that says that. There's no verse in the Bible that says a woman must wear dresses and skirts at all times. Amen? There's no verse in the Bible that says you have to have church on Wednesday night or Thursday night. Right? The Bible isn't, doesn't say those things. There are many areas of the Christian life that are not clearly right or wrong to every believer. Some things we absolutely know are wrong because the Bible clearly condemns it. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not steal. Those are absolutely crystal clear. And some areas that we know are absolutely right because the Bible commands it. If you love me, keep my commandments, right? We are to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Those are things that the Bible commands us. And so we know them to be right, and we know them to be exactly what God wants us to do. But when it comes to the areas of life that the Bible is not clearly defined for us, we need to find something else to give us more guidance. And I believe that Paul gave us some principles to guide us through the gray areas of life in Romans chapter 14. Paul explained how believers are going to disagree on issues where the Bible is silent, those gray areas of the Christian life. The Bible commands us to prefer one another. The Bible commands us to think on the things of others, not on the, our own things. To esteem others higher than ourselves. To, in the case of Romans chapter 14, receive one another. So let's read our text. Romans chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. Let not him that which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. He that regardeth not the day to the Lord he regardeth or doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, he that, for he giveth God thanks. He that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. There is our title for the message. We are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ... Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you so much. For the opportunity we have this morning to come here to worship you in song, in giving. And now, Lord, as we open your word, may you bless the preaching of your word. May it affect our hearts and lives. May it change us where we need it. May it bring about repentance, humbleness, and help us, Lord, to see the damage we could be doing when we are arguing or disputing and not receiving one another. Lord, I pray that you would help me to speak clearly. May your word cause conviction in our hearts, and may we 
uh, humble ourselves and allow your word to have the preeminence in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You'll notice in verse 1, Paul is addressing stronger Christians. He says to the stronger Christian, him that is weak in the faith, receive ye. When, other, when he's talking to stronger Christians, he says you need to receive the weaker Christians. Stronger Christians are those who recognize their freedom in Christ and who are not enslaved to Old Testament laws. They're not enslaved to the traditions of men or We've always done this, so we're just going to keep on doing it. They're not enslaved to that. They realize that they have freedom in Christ, and that uh, with that freedom, they don't have to always do the traditional thing. The Christians who are weak in the faith, as we see them described here, um, where is it? Verses 2 and 3. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak. So you'll notice that he is weak. In verse 1, him that is weak in the faith, receive ye. So those that are weak in the faith are those immature believers who felt that they are obligated, if you will, to obey legalistic rules concerning what they ate, when they worshipped, how they did these things. Uh, And so you have these uh, Christians who... The Bible calls them weak. When you and I, we would look at them and say, hey, they got really high standards that they live up to. They must be really strong Christians. Well, the truth is not always. See, many people believe that those Christians who follow the stricter rules, the higher standards, are more mature, and that, it is, that is not always the case. If they are following the stricter standards out of duty or performance or the sense of obligation, then they are not strong Christians. But if they are following the higher standard and the stricter standard out of a love for Christ and a thankfulness for Him, then they could be and probably are the stronger Christian. In Rome, the weaker Christians were hanging on to the law and they could not enjoy their freedom in Christ. These weaker Christians were judging and condemning the stronger believers for not having high enough standards, and the stronger believers believers were despising the weaker believers for their perceived pride in their own performance. In verse 1, the Bible clearly commands that we are to receive one another. We are to not look at each other's maturity level, but we are to receive one another. Brother Troy, could you close that door for me, please? Thank you. Different people have different customs, different cultures, and even different taboos. Things that they say, well, we shouldn't do that or this. If there's one area where we must have love and respect, it is in the area and the context of our relationships with each other. We must not be dogmatic about preferences or differences of culture and customs. In other words, we are to receive one another, differences and all. Paul gives us four reasons why. But let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. In many cultures, starting, I think this was influenced by Jewish culture, but to European culture and then later came from Europe to Western culture, uh, it is rude to reach over somebody at the dinner table to grab something. We usually, at the, at the d- dinner table, will say, please pass the potatoes, please pass the salt or pepper, whatever. How many of you know, know this? All right, so this is a Western, started in Israel, still is in Israel, kind of moved to Europe and then over. In the Philippines, this is not the case, right? It's not rude because in the Philippines you have boodle fights, right? How many of you know what a boodle fight is, the Canadians? All right, a boodle fight is where they have all the food on the middle on, I think, banana leaves or what kind of, yeah? And it's all there and you just grab it with your hands and, and you eat it like that. You, you know, there are no plates, nothing. And so when when you crisscross those cultures, we need to be able to say, hey, you're a good Christian because you do it your way, and I'm a good Christian because I do it my way, and there's no right or wrong. So that's like one one instance, all right, one example of difference of culture. Now, we can can spend all day going in all the different differences of culture and backgrounds that we have. That's not the point. 
The point is, we need to receive each other. We need to look at each other and not condescend, not judge, just realize that there are different backgrounds, different cultures, and we are the same uh, in Christ. Amen? There's no Greek or Jew in Christ. There's no man or woman in Christ. There's no bond or free. We are all equal in Christ. And so four reasons Paul gives us as to why we should receive one another. Number one is found in verses one through three, and that is God has received us. All right? Why should I receive you? Because God received you. Why should you receive me? Because God received me. We are not the ones who decide the conditions of fellowship within our church. Only the Lord can do that. I can't say, you know, I'm not going to fellowship with so-and-so because they just they have a different culture, a different background. I don't like something about them. That's not how it should be. Jesus Christ decides the conditions of fellowship. We can't say, well, I'm not going to fellowship with that person because they don't wear a tie to church. To set up man-made restrictions based on our preferences or our own, even our own convictions is to supersede the Scriptures, to take place of the Scriptures and say, well, I know better than God. Because God receives us, we must receive each other. Amen? Oh, that wasn't loud enough. I said amen? All right. So if God received all of us, why can we not receive one another, right? We shouldn't be arguing over matters of, that are honestly non-essential. We should not be arguing over matters of culture, background, customs, traditions. Those things don't matter. What we, what we need to be focusing is on is our love for Christ, the doctrine, make sure the doctrine is pure, and our mutual coming together to accomplish the goal that Christ has for us as a church. We should not be criticizing each other. We should not be judging one another. Because if we do those things, unity in our church will never be possible. Above all else, we must give room for charity. Now that word charity is an old English word, and it speaks specifically of agape love. Now agape love is that love that Christ has for you and me. Unconditional, sacrificial love. And Jesus Christ said, I give you a new commandment. And the new commandment was that you love one another even as I, Christ, have loved you you, right? Here it is in Colossians 3.14. And above all things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Charity is the bond that keeps us together. Charity and doctrine will keep us together. When God sent Peter to the house of Cornelius to share the gospel with the Gentiles, the church criticized Peter for eating with Gentiles. God had clearly received the Gentiles, as the Gentiles also received the Holy Spirit, as did the Jews. But even Peter didn't always obey this truth in his own life and ministry. In fact, Peter went up to Antioch, and he refused to eat and fellowship with the Gentiles in Antioch, and he kind of made a division, insomuch that it even influenced Barnabas, who was pastoring there, and Barnabas went over to the Jewish side, and Paul had to get up and rebuke them both, because they, would ref they refused to eat together with the Gentiles and to, and to uh, fellowship with them. And so God had to show Peter and Paul that Christian fellowship was not based on food, it was not based on religious days, culture, custom, uh, skin color, education, social status, or language even. Unity is based on, Christian fellowship is based on grace, salvation, and Jesus Christ. In every church, here's a statement I make, you might want to write this down. In every church, there are weak and strong Christians. Every church has weak and strong Christians. The strong Christians understand spiritual truth and the freedom in Christ and they practice it. If you've been listening to our Real Christianity Sunday night, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Those Sunday night series that we had on real Christianity. And so we understand as a strong Christian, if you're a strong Christian, you understand you're free in Christ. And you practice your freedom in Christ. Where the Bible is gray, you're, you're silent. Where the Bible is absolutely clear, you're loud. Because you're basing your beliefs on the Bible. The weaker Christian have not yet grown to that level of maturity and liberty, 
And so the weaker Christian must not condemn the stronger and call them unspiritual. Usually what the weaker Christian is, is someone who needs rules and regulations. They need standards to keep them on the straight and narrow because without them they're lost. Whereas a stronger Christian understands the freedom he has in Christ and he is able to, to live and, and move around and do things in life because he understands that the limits are what the Bible says, what, where the Bible is clear. Where it's gray, you have freedom. And so the weak must not condemn the strong and call them unspiritual. Many times the stronger Christian to the weaker Christian seems like a more liberal Christian. Footloose and fancy free. The strong must not criticize the weak and call them immature. God has received both the strong and the weak. Notice what it says. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. Let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. God has received both strong and weak Christians. Therefore, we must receive one another. Amen? So that's the first reason. God has received us, and if God received us, then we must receive each other. Number two, God upholds his own. Notice it, verse four. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth, yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. God upholds his own servants. The strong are tempted to criticize and to be condescending to the weaker Christians. And the weaker are tempted to condemn the stronger Christian for being flexible with their conscience. God asks us a question. He says, who are you to judge another man's servant? I want you to take this question to heart because he's asking it to you. He's asking it to me. Who are you, who am I, to judge another man's servant? Let me ask it this way. How can you not fellowship with someone in your own church that God does fellowship with? Amen? How can you not fellowship with someone in your own church who God does fellowship with? You say, well, I can't fellowship with them because they're always eating rice. <laughs> or a Filipino might say, I can't fellowship with them because all they ever eat is potatoes. Right? Just as an example. <laughs> and you should, be, you should be laughing about this because it's funny. You, I mean, to, to, but think about this. This is how they were separating in those days over food. That person eats meat. Well, I can't eat meat with them. I can't go fellowship with them because they eat meat. Or this person holds Christmas, celebrates Christmas, so I can't fellowship with them because they celebrate Christmas. And it was this, they were separating over non-essential issues. And God says, how can you not fellowship with someone in your own church that I'm fellowshipping with? How can you judge them? Who are you to judge another man's servant? Are you not God, I mean, you are not God to say that your brother or your sister in Christ is not worthy of your love and respect and fellowship. You are not God. You don't get to make that choice. We cannot take the place of God in the life of someone else. We can't say, you know what, until you start straightening up and until you start keeping my customs and my traditions and my preferences, I'm not going to fellowship with you. It doesn't work that way. We cannot take the place of God in the life of someone else. God is the master. Amen. Look at verse 4. To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. God is the master. And he is able to hold me up, and he's able to hold you up, and he can make us stand. I want you to notice in verse 4 the word servant. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant. The, the in interesting word, thing about this word servant is it indicates that we as Christians should be worky, working for the Lord, busy working for Christ. Servants don't stand around and do nothing. Servants don't stand around and criticize other servants. Servants are too busy working. 
And if we're too busy working for the Lord, we won't have time or the inclination to judge or criticize someone else. Amen? People who are busy winning souls, singing Christian songs, singing in the choir, teaching Sunday school, ushering, playing in the music, doing John and Romans, whatever part or, or little whatever part of service you have in this church or want to have, if you're busy doing those things, you won't have time to be criticizing other people. People who are busy winning souls, serving Christ, are have more important things to do than to investigate the lives of other Christians. Amen. So the second reason why we should receive one another is is because God upholds his own. Let God take care of his own servants. Let God uphold his own servant. You worry about what God has you to do. Amen? Number three, Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord, verses 5 through 9. One man esteemeth one day above another, yet another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. He that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. He that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us live to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For this, to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord, both of the dead and the living. As I read these verses, have you noticed how many times these verses, 5 through 9, say the word Lord? Over and over and over again. In four verses, the Bible uses the word Lord eight times. In other words, God really wants to make this absolutely clear to us. Jesus Christ is Lord. You are not Lord in somebody else's life. Nobody else can be Lord in your life. Jesus Christ is Lord. Not brother so-and-so, not sister you-know-who. Jesus Christ is Lord. No Christian has the right to play God in the life of another Christian. Amen? Can I get more nods of head at least? You agree with this? God is the only one who is Lord, not you, not me. Even as a pastor, I am not the Lord of your life. Jesus Christ ought to be the Lord of your life. When you come to church, you're not coming for me, you're coming for Jesus Christ. When you sing in the choir or play the violin or guitar or piano or you teach a Sunday school class or you come out and do soul winning or you come out and do some John and Romans, whatever you're doing, don't do it for me, don't do it for someone else, you do it unto the Lord. Whether you live, you live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Let Jesus Christ be the Lord. Let me ask you this. Does that mean we can't give advice? No, we can give advice. We can give counsel. We can pray with and for one another. Amen. Even admonish one another. Hey, I think maybe you should think about this if you haven't already. And not bring rebuke, but admonish and say, hey, have you, have you looked at it from this perspective? Don't play God. But we cannot take the place of God. So we can, we can give advice, we can counsel, we can pray with one another, we can admonish one another, we can even provoke one another unto love and good works, as the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10. But we cannot take the place of God. Let me ask you this question. What makes food holy? Some said this food is good, some, this food's not good. What makes food holy? What makes a certain day of the year Holy whether it's Easter, Christmas, one of the Jewish uh, celebrations, what makes those days holy? What makes a suit and tie holy? What makes a woman in a skirt or dress holy? What makes the counterparts of all that unholy? If someone holds a holy day or doesn't hold a holy day, they do so or don't do so, as the Bible says, unto the Lord. So, 
what makes something holy? What makes me coming to church in a suit and tie holy? What makes me coming to, ch to church not in a suit and tie not holy? You see what I'm getting at? It doesn't matter because my clothes aren't holy, whether they're suit and tie or just a shirt. What makes me holy, what makes my service to Christ holy is, am I doing it unto the Lord? That's what makes holy. Is it for the Lord? Notice the phrase uh, in, our, in your text there, verse um, 5 at the end of the verse, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So let me ask you this. If someone comes to church in a suit and tie or a nice shirt and a sports coat or even casual clothes, they do so unto the Lord. Did you notice last week when I was here preaching, I didn't have a suit and tie? I had a cowboy shirt on and a borrow. And jeans. I was preaching in jeans. Can you imagine that? How unholy is that to preach in jeans? Right? What makes it holy is it was for the Lord, unto the Lord. And so instead of criticizing, oh, look, so-and-so came and she's in pants or so-and-so came and he doesn't have a tie on, don't worry. Be glad they came to church. It's not your place or my place to judge or to criticize someone else. We are not their God. Jesus Christ is Lord. Let every person be fully persuaded in his own mind. In other words, let every person see to it that what they are doing, how they are dressing, how they're worshiping, whether it's you know keeping Christmas or eating meat or not eating meat or whatever tradition it is, make sure that you're doing it not out of tradition, not out of duty, not out of performance, not out of some prejudice or some whim or even rebellion against the tradition. Make sure that whatever you're doing, however you're serving, it's unto the Lord. And it's for Him, not for somebody else. So if I come to church and I come to church, I, I dress up in a suit and tie, but I do it for you, it's not unto the Lord. It's not holy. But if I come into church in jeans and a cowboy shirt and cowboy boots, and I do it unto the Lord. It is more holy than if I come to church in a suit and tie. You get what I'm saying? It doesn't matter the output. What matters is the heart of the issue. Is it unto the Lord, or is it out of tradition, duty, performance, culture? Should be unto the Lord, not out of any other reason. We have some standards in our circles, in our churches, that are very traditional. And many of them are very good. But they are not necessarily scriptural. You say, why, pastor, do you come in a suit and tie and preach in a suit and tie most often? I'll tell you why. Because I believe in my heart, this is personal preference. This has nothing to do with anybody else. You can take it or leave it. My preference is if I'm going to come into church, I want to come into church dressed up my very best for Jesus Christ. And if the sports people at Sportsnet and on, on news if they can dress up in a suit and tie, why can't I? Right? Now, is that to say that I'll always come to church in a suit and tie? No. We might have special days like stampede days. We might have some times where, you know, I just don't feel like wearing a suit and tie. I might come Sunday night without a tie. That should not affect anybody. It should not be of any concern to anybody, whether here in church or some other pastor looking at our church. Because whether or not I come in a suit and tie doesn't matter. What matters is, are you coming unto the Lord? Are you coming to church unto the Lord? Are you serving Christ unto the Lord? Don't do it for men's sake, tradition's sake, prejudice, culture. We have some standards in our church that are traditional and they're good if they're done for the right reasons, but they're not necessarily scriptural. Nowhere in scripture does it say come to church in a suit and tie. Nowhere in Scripture does it say you have to celebrate Christmas on December 25th. Nowhere in Scripture does it say Easter is always where the, where the Catholic Church says it is. Amen? There was a time when churches were against Christian radio. Can you imagine that? 
churches were against Christian radio. You know why? Because back then they were saying Satan is the prince and power of the air. And whenever you go on radio, you're on air. So you are serving Satan because you're on air. That was their logic. Except for the Bible has nothing against radio, does it? Here's another one. It wasn't long ago when some churches were against screens in, t- in, in the church. Even today, there are churches today that are against having this screen right here in front of a church. They think it's wicked. Show me one verse in the Bible that says you can't use screens. It wasn't too long ago. There was a time when churches were against having a piano in church. Because the only other place you could find a piano was in a saloon. Now, if you don't have a piano in church, they think you're weird. So traditions and cultures change over time, but don't matter because the Bible doesn't say anything about it. Amen? So whether we have a piano, whether we have guitars and violin or or banjo or anything else, it doesn't matter as long as it's unto the Lord. Now, what about rock and roll guitars and, and drums? That's a whole different story, right? We're not bringing worldly music into the church. Let me give you an example. In John 21, Jesus had just restored Peter after his resurrection. Peter had denied Jesus Christ three times, and he was kind of ashamed throughout this whole time. And uh, Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. After the third time, Jesus says to Peter, follow me. Just follow me. If you love me, follow me. Peter began to follow Jesus Christ. But then he heard somebody behind him. He looked back and it was the Apostle John, the Apostle whom Jesus loved. And Peter says, but Lord, what what shall this man do? Peter, Peter, instead of focusing on himself, Lord, I'm going to follow you. He turns around, he sees John, he says, okay, Lord, what shall this man do? Jesus' response to Peter was this. Jesus saith unto him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. In other words, don't worry what John's doing. Don't worry what the other apostles are doing. Don't worry what the church down the street is doing. Don't worry what the sister or brother in the chair next to you is doing. Follow thou me. Do it unto the Lord. Peter, you make sure that you have made me Lord of your life, and don't worry about John. Next time you feel the urge to condemn or criticize your fellow believer because of something you disagree with in their life, something that is not clear in Scripture, Imagine Jesus asking you, what is that to thee? Why do you care? What is it to thee? Follow Jesus Christ. Let Jesus be Lord. Verse 8 tells us the first responsibility is to, to the Lord. He is our Lord. We belong to Him. Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. If we, go, if we would go to the Lord in prayer instead of going to our brother and sister in criticism... There would be a stronger fellowship in our church, amen? You guys are done already? I'm almost done. (laughs) Number four, final, Jesus Christ is judge. So not only is Jesus Christ Lord, but Jesus Christ is judge. Verses 10 through 12, but why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou not Uh, Why dost thou set at not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Paul asked the weaker Christian, why are you judging your brother for being so liberal in his conscience? Paul asked the stronger Christian, why are you despising or set at naught is the phrase there. The word set at naught means to treat as worthless or to despise. Why are you despising your weaker brother? All Christians, strong and weak, will stand at the judgment seat of Christ and we will not be judged by our brothers and sisters in Christ. We will not be judged by Brother Troy or Brother Anders or Brother Vasi. We will not be judged by any of you ladies. And you will not be judged of any of us men. And Filipinos won't be judged by white people. And white people won't be judged by black people. It, nobody. Everybody will be judged by Jesus Christ. He is the judge. 
It's called the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is a place where all Christians have all their works judged by Christ. Now, this judgment has nothing to do with our sins. All of our sins were already judged on the cross when Jesus Christ paid for it all. He shed his blood. He covered our sins. He forgave us. But all of our good works will be judged at this judgment seat of Christ. Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I didn't put it up on the screen because it's a bit long. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And we'll see there this idea of being judged. The Greek word for judgment seat is the word bima. And the bima seat, or the judgment seat of Christ, is the place where the judges would sit during the Olympics. You know that the Olympics are going on right now in Tokyo. All of the judges, if they witnessed cheating during the games, they would immediately disqualify a contestant. At the end of the contest, the judges gave out the rewards. Usually it was a, a reef. In the Greek, the Greek word for reef is stephanos. It is the victor's crown. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Paul says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. He's making a correlation between the Olympic Games, someone running in the games or wrestling or fighting in the games, and, so, and Christians, we need to be fighting for the crown. They're fighting for a reef, a corruptible crown. We're fighting for an incorruptible crown. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. This is a different kind of a, of a picture that Paul gives us with regards to the judgment seat of Christ. <coughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 10. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So in this second passage, Paul compares our Christian service to the building of a temple. If we build with cheap materials, such as wood, hay, and stubble, the fire will burn them up. If we use precious lasting materials like gold, silver, and precious stones, then our works will last, and we will receive the reward. If our works burn up, we lose the reward, and we are still saved, still get to go to heaven, yet as by fire. So let me ask a question. What determines the materials we use? It is our motives for why we are serving. Our motives, for, if they are pure, and we are motivated by our love and gratitude for Christ and His grace, we will have lasting works of gold, silver, and precious stones. But if our motives are impure, like performance-based, uh, serving for the applause of men, then our works will be burned up. So how do we as Christians prepare for the judgment seat of Christ? I'll tell you how. By making Jesus Christ the Lord of our lives and faithfully serving and obeying Him. If we make Him the Lord, not Pastor Vossi, not so-and-so's standards, not so-and-so's culture, Lord Jesus Christ, make Him the Lord, serve Him faithfully, and obey Him. Instead of judging or criticizing others, we should be focusing on our own lives and our own service. See, sin will keep us from serving God as we should. And sin will always cause us to look at other men's works, other men's lives, and criticize and or judge. Remember Lot? Lot in the Old Testament? Lot was a man who lived life on the edge. He pitched his tent towards Sodom and eventually ended up in Sodom. Lot wasn't walking with God like his uncle Abraham was walking with God. Lot, the Bible says, Lot vexed his soul. Notice this in 2 Peter 2.8. For that righteous man dwelling among them, speaking of Lot, in seeing and hearing 
vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. He put himself right in the middle of Sin City of those days. It was Sin City, Sodom. And every day he watched and heard all the evil things that were going on around him, and he vexed his soul. He was a Christian with no testimony. He was a righteous man. The Bible calls him righteous. The result was that Lot lost his testimony with his family. So when the two angels came to get his family out of the city because they were going to destroy it, Lot went to his children to warn them, and they didn't believe him. They thought he was trying, he was mocking them. He was trying to pull a prank on them. Lot ended up being saved alone with his two daughters. He lost his wife. She turned into a pillar of salt when she turned around. He lost his two daughters because they had sinned grievously against the Lord in sleeping with him, their own father, just to preserve their seed. And yet the Bible says he was a righteous man. In other words, he was saved, let me tell you what, yet as by fire. Listen, we don't have to give an account of ourselves to our brothers and sisters, but there will come a day when we will have to give an account of ourselves, of our lives, to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not only Lord, He is the judge. Warren Wiersbe tells of the story of two famous Christians in the Victorian area in England, Charles Spurgeon and Joseph Parker. Both of them mighty preachers of the gospel. Early on in their ministries, they had fellowshiped with one another. They even exchanged pulpits. They did pulpit swaps and that they had uh, a disagreement, and they stopped fellowshipping. And the reports even got to the newspapers about this disagreement. Spurgeon accused Parker of being unspiritual because he attended the movie theaters, or not movie, but theaters during those days. He attended the theaters. And so because Parker attended the theaters, Spurgeon said, "You're you're not spiritual. You are a weak Christian, when in fact he was the stronger Christian. He understood his freedom in Christ. Spurgeon was the weaker Christian because he needed those, those standards to keep him in place. Interestingly enough, though, Spurgeon smoked cigars during that time. So here you have one guy going to the theaters and being criticized by the guy who smokes. A practice that many believers even today would condemn. Right? Right? So who was right and who was wrong? I'll tell you what, they were both wrong. They were both wrong. They should never have criticized and condemned one another. So when it comes to the gray areas of the Christian life, those areas that the scriptures are not clear on, can we not disagree without being argumentative and disagreeable? Can we not just say, you have your convictions, I have my convictions, we're not going to talk about them, we're just going to receive one another in brotherly love. I found that God blesses people who disagree with you. God blesses people who disagree with me. See, Brother J.R., he loves rice. I bet you he eats rice every day. I don't know if I could ever do that. I don't think I can agree with that. (laughs) Me, on the other hand, I love potatoes. I could eat potatoes every day. I could eat hash browns in the morning, french fries in the afternoon, baked potato in the, after, in the evening. I could eat potato, and I bet you Brother J.R. said, no, I could never do that. I can't agree with you. <laughs> but you know what? Me and Brother J.R., we are brothers in the same church family, in the same family of Jesus Christ. And you know what? We don't care what each other eats. Amen? And if they have me over for dinner, I'm going to eat rice. And if I have them over for dinner, they're going to eat potatoes. And we're going to love each other and receive each other. And we're going to keep on being brothers. And we're going to keep on receiving each other. Why? Because those things are gray areas and those things are not essential. They don't matter. What does matter is when he eats his rice, does he pray and ask Jesus Christ to bless it and give thanks for it? When I eat my potatoes, do I pray and give thanks for it and ask Jesus Christ to bless it? That's all that matters. If you eat or drink whatsoever you do, do it unto the Lord. Do it for his glory. You celebrate Christmas, fine. You don't, fine. doesn't matter. May we focus on our own duty to obey the command of Christ. That one command that He gave us, love one another even as He loved us. Instead of focusing on the things that we disagree with others about. I'll, I'll give you this verse again. It is key. Above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. I want our church to be tied together with that bond of perfectness. And the only way we as a church can do that 
is if we, above all else, put on charity. Unconditional, sacrificial love. I will put the needs of my fellow church members above my own, and my fellow church members will put the needs of others above their own, and we all serve a common Savior. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is judge. God can uphold his own. Therefore, we need to receive one another because God received us. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word this morning. We thank you for the Holy Spirit you've given us to be our teacher. And Lord, I pray that you would bring about a greater unity in our church because of the message this morning, that you would work in our hearts and lives, bring about a change in our attitudes toward one another. If there is some kind of animosity, pray that you'd help us, Lord, to love each other, to receive each other, to neglect the temptation to criticize and condemn over things that the Scripture is completely silent on. And help us to, as a church, put on charity that bond of, perfect, of perfectness so that we together can serve Christ and accomplish the goal that He has for us in our lives, in our marriages, in our church. Help us to put on charity. We ask this in Jesus' name.